Huge moment here at the Engine Performance Expo. Each year, we like to honor and highlight the greatest of the great in Lake. We're going to continue that trend right now. And we're taking it to a whole nother level. So right over there at that table, which you can't see from that camera angle right now, is our round table. And last year, at the final round table, at the end of the day, we put a stake in the ground and said, you know what? We're going to go beyond this Lifetime Achievement Award. We need to do something to really honor the heroes of the engine building business. There needs to be an Engine Builder Hall, Hall of, of fame. fame. Yeah. No, I mean, and you have to understand, growing up in this industry, you know, I called in the very tail end of very magic time. Mm -hmm. You know, when some of the first people that I got to talk to was like Bob Glidden. You know, and you think about, and I mean, Bob cussed me like you wouldn't believe and stuff like that. They're, you know, you get to meet these people and they're heroes that you grew up, you grew up reading about and everything like that. And you start learning that this community, it's known inside the community who the real players were. Right. And these guys, they not only did amazing things, but they had left a legacy behind them. They trained people. You know, we've looked at it as you've been doing interviews, mm -hmm. you'll find out, well, this guy worked with this guy who taught this guy and everything like that. And it's like these coaching legacies. It's like these family trees. And there needs to be a place that's not just about the results on the track. There's places for that, right? Yes, absolutely. NASCAR Hall of Fame, NHRA's got Hall of Fame, everything like that. But where is it for our sport, the engine bill of sport, to recognize the people who laid down the foundations that we build on today? I couldn't say it any better than that. So here's what we need to do. I think we need to go ahead and show the videos here in just a second. But kind of to preface the videos, mm -hmm. what we've done is we've broken this down into four eras. Yes. So because to make it things fair, right? So we have the pre-war era. Mm -hmm. So basically all the guys who were before World War II. Right. And they lived in a very different era because pre-war, there weren't any of these cylinder head manufacturers. If you had an idea, you created a pattern, you melted aluminum, you poured it into sand, you built it from hand. And so these guys deserve a, a place of their own because right. that's a whole different deal. Oh, completely different ball game, right? Mm -hmm. Well, then you have the post-war era because now you, you got the big automakers, you got mass production, it's a different thing. So we have the pre-war era, we have the post-war era, up until about like 1960. Mm -hmm. Then, yeah, like when Mike was sitting here a minute ago, right? well, then that was the kind of that golden age where things really started to take off. Welding on a TRW piston, is that, I mean, that was worth the trip up here in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wait, time out. Did I hear that right? You know, that was that, those guys in right. that era, you know, and that lasted until probably the mid 70s. Mm -hmm. Then you got companies like Comp Cams and stuff. Everyone's yeah. really coming in. There's, there's, there's more aftermarket parts now. I mean, the first year of PRI, you could have put this building we're in today for Engine Performance Expo could have fit 10 PRIs, right? Yeah. You know, that they were, it was tiny. You go in today, it's a million square feet. Yeah. So what was it like during that era as it blew up into what we know today as the aftermarket industry? Right. So then you've got that next group that kind of came 70s to the 90s, like you said. So that's our group. So mm -hmm. what we're going to do is we're going to show you only one person in the inaugural class yeah. from each of those eras. And then tomorrow we're going to come back and we'll show you the second one. But go ahead and watch the video now and we'll come back and we'll discuss our selection in the end. Our entire industry, Lake and I have real jobs. We all have real jobs because of the work that was done by guys in this room. When Harry Miller was building these engines, there wasn't a aftermarket. There wasn't an, any of these. There weren't Edelbrocks. There weren't Winfields. There weren't Iskadarians yet. He made all of this by hand, basically. So all of these engines, when you think about, you know, ooh, double overhead cams. This double overhead cam engine was built like this. All of these are neat. Like, these engines don't have head gaskets in them. They would actually have to come up from the bottom and machine the valve seats in here because they, when they boosted these, they had so much power they blow every head gasket. So they're like, okay, we'll fix that. I got we'll yelled at for that I in the Ed Pink video. You know, <laughs> I said, "Is I, that an Offie head?" They're like, "You don't know Offies don't have heads." I'm like, uh, yeah. "No, sir, I don't know that. <laughs> I'm not 60 years old." <laughs> here is your Offie. Yeah, that is the little one ten. Here's your 270 Offie. 
When did they realize that maybe making the head removable would be easier to work on? Um, mid fifties. I think the gasket, the gasket technology had to come around. Like, you know, there's a lot of things that go on here. They, you know, carburetors, they weren't good at metering fuel back in the day. So they had these updraft carburetors. So as everything got hot in here, it made the fuel more like lighter and vapor and it'd be able to dis distribute better and burn better. You have to realize this is really before gasoline was gasoline, you know? These early motors were low this compression. Pre-tetral ethyl lead. Right, now there was nothing like that. So you have to understand like, you have people like Rockefeller who were big on prohibition to get the bootleggers out of the gasoline market so the oil guys could have more of it. Yeah. So everything that we take for granted that just existed, it didn't exist back then. But I mean, think about these guys running the big superchargers on the front and you know, what'd you say 10 times today or 20 times today? that no ideas are really all that new. Well, We've no. just gotten the execution better. Well, like this engine right here is a 1953 Studebaker with four valves per cylinder, overhead camshafts, hemi headed. I mean, what's your Hondas and Toyotas today? Four valves per cylinder, overhead cam, hemispherical combustion chamber. This was 1953. Yep, right. Agajanian. That's a familiar name too. We just did the Mike Car Museum. Yes. Yeah. Yep. No, the same at, people keep yeah. coming up over and over again. Yeah. I mean, look yeah. at this. I mean, check out this draft table from I mean, imagine the talent it took to go in here and be able to conceive what's going on in three dimensions. There wasn't any CAD at the time. They weren't able to, to rotate it. No like, rapid they, prototyping. They had to do this by hand. I mean, and when it came time to make it, you made a sand casting, you poured it, or you had to machine it out of billet. So these guys were, man, they were just so, so good at what they did. He wanted to make good stuff, actually. He wanted to make boat engines, he wanted to make automobile engines. Actually made some fantastic engines. The person who helped him the most was Leo Goosen, because Miller would say, I need this, 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 here's a concept. And Leo would write it all out and put it on paper and they'd get machined and everything worked. I had the Packard Wire Special car in my shop in Redwood City. It was a Miller race car with a supercharger on it. We were going to restore it for the owner. Right now, the Packard Wire Special is in the Smithsonian. That engine was pretty cool. Uh, all the stuff on it was really nice. Uh, the machine work, he always had craftsmen working on stuff. Harry Miller was always going up and down, making a lot of money, losing a lot of money, making money, but he, he really loved what he was doing. Okay, I'm going to tell you a good story. Last year, for Esky's birthday, they did a birthday for him at the Peterson Museum. And they invited a few people to be part of a group honoring him. There was about six or seven of us. And I was sitting right next to Ed. And everybody's saying their little thing about him. And, uh, and all of a sudden, Esky looks over at me and he says, you know something? He says, do you remember when you used to be an usher at that theater, and I'm thinking, this goes back to, I was probably uh, 14 years old, maybe 15, and it was a theater on Adams Boulevard, Adams and Crenshaw Boulevard, called the Bard's Theater. And I would work there as an usher. And Esky came in a couple times, and I would take him to his seat, usher him to his seat in the movie house. And he said to me, he said, you know, I remember. And he brought that thing up and told me. And I told him, I said, you got a hell of a memory. Because as he said, and I remembered, yeah, I did work at the Bard Theater. And, and I know I was really young, 14, 15, maybe 16 years old as an usher. And I ushered him to his seat a couple of times. He and I were, were 10 years apart. He's, he's 10 years older than me. Now, his life is a pretty open book. He not a secret person. He, uh, he's, he's very good with people. Uh, he knows his friends. 
and uh, he knows the people that are just hanger oners that really aren't friends or just acquaintances, but he knows his friends. And he and I have been friends for a lot of years. I can remember back when I was a young guy past the Bard's Theater deal, and I used to ride my bike, and he, when he was living at home with his parents, he had a machine, that he had a machine in the garage. And in those days, garages didn't open to the street, they opened to an alley. And I used to ride my bike back and forth across the alley, looking in at his little garage, wondering what he was doing. And I was always afraid to stop and go in and talk to him. He might run me out and I wouldn't be able to do that anymore. So I'd just ride my bike up back and forth in the, in the alley, looking in his garage to see what he was working on. But I had no idea what he was doing. 59, 58, right in there, mm -hmm. I had a repair shop. It used to be Frank Barron's on Venison Highland. And he would, he would come to see me every once in a while. And it had a little driveway. So he, he'd pull up on the driveway and his car would be like this. He'd be in an old Cadillac. And he'd get out of the car and oranges and apples would fall out and roll down the driveway. And he, he would get, a, in fact, Sylvia has a picture of one of his cars that finally got to the point that he had to park it because there was no room for him to sit. He doesn't throw anything away. Uh, and I'll tell you a, a very cute story. One time, when he when he was still working full time, I needed to go and see him. And this is back, probably in the early '60s, when I first opened my first shop, first engine shop. And I went to the front desk, and uh, Norris Baronian was working for him, who later was Baronian Cams, Norris Cams. But anyway. Uh, I took, they all knew me and I knew everybody there. And, and I said, I came in to see Ed, okay. And they took, they took me to his office. And they sat me down in this chair behind his desk on the front, of his, the front side of his desk. And I'm sitting in the chair waiting for Esky to show up. Cause, and all of a sudden I'm sitting there and I look up like I'm looking at you and I see this little smoke ring go up in the eye. And I stood up and I looked it was Ed. He was sitting at the desk, but he's got so much junk piled on his desk, I couldn't see him. And all of a sudden, he's, he was smoking a cigar, and the cigar smoke went up, and I realized there's somebody there. And I get up and look, and there he is. And I says, how long have you been here? He says, I've been here a long time. How long have you been here? I said, well, I've been sitting here for five or ten minutes waiting for you to come in here. I've been here all the time. And I said, well, he couldn't see you. He was in everything, in the camshafts and lifters and push rods and valve springs. And uh, back in the day, he was the go-to guy if you, you, for camshafts or whatever. And he had his, uh, his brother uh, was one of his cam designers. They had him locked in a room all the time while he was doing all his designing. You know, the thing is this, that he knew what needed to get done and he got the right people to help him do it. And he didn't nickel and dime stuff. He, he did it right. He, he, he was good for the sport, and the sport was good for him. I think it was a two-way street. He wasn't a guy that sold cams and took the profit and ran. You know, he, he, took, he, he took care of everybody. He took care of his customers. And uh, now he's the first one with real race t-shirts. Yeah, he actually was the guy. He was, his cams were good, his springs were good, all this stuff was good. He did good PR work. He took care of his people, and the good Lord's taking care of him, letting him live so long. I would say, as he earned his with his performance and his promotions, and Vic did it flat racing and making racing equipment for the Flathead. What a character. I uh, go out and see his son, Richard Ron, and of course had to catch up with Ed. Well, Ed eats at the same hamburger place as he ate for for the last hundred years. <laughs> and so we had to go down there. And what is so fascinating about Ed, now last time I saw Ed, he was probably, I don't know, 92 or 93. 
And the first thing Ed wants to know is, what are you doing? And he wants to know, what are you doing on this? And then he'd say, you know, back in 38 on this engine, we found, I mean, Ed's mind is just, you can see why he was so successful, because he never stopped thinking and never stopped inquiring. And, uh, I mean, I can't tell you. He, one of the fun things about Ed is he hated trash. And so he'd get an old car, and he'd start picking stuff up off the sidewalk and putting it in the car. And I go to Rich, I said, it looks like the trash is up covering everything. Oh, he says, oh, yeah, I got 10 more cars in the back that Ed did spend. I go, really? And so I got there another time, and he had part of his hamburger, and he was feeding, feeding the pigeons. And when he got down, done, he took this wrapper, went over and threw it in his new trash bin at the car. And uh, Ed obviously came through the Depression, and nothing was wasted. Everything was saved and reused, and just how Ed carries himself in that manner is amazing. I mean, not many people at his age are still interested in everything else. You know, if it's auto-related or an engine or something, he wants to know about it. And uh, uh, just a super nice, never had an opinion of somebody was bad or not right or this or that, just a wonderful guy. And, uh, of course, the same thing flowed through to Richard and Ron, both great guys. And, uh, but Ed, one off. I can't believe he's still here, but it's wonderful he is. I had an absolute joy at PRI a couple of years ago. We used to go sneak around and miss breakfast lines, go to the subway that was back behind some of the hotels. And I go into the subway one morning and it's Dave Henniger and myself. We get up there and we sit down and who sits down in the booth next to us but Ed Iskadarian. Ed Iskadarian had a, um, a presentation he was going to give at 10.30 that, that day. And it's about 8.30 in the morning. He proceeds, finds out we had comp cam shirts on, you know, and then proceeds to go over his presentation for over an hour, talking about everything that's going on in the engine, how the intake stroke really works, what's going on in overlap, about wave tuning. You know, I am listening to a guy who's probably at the time about 97, 98 years old, who never had the modeling and the ability to test that we have today. And yet he's going through all the fundamentals of how the camshaft is the conductor of the entire engine airflow package. And the amazing ability he had, it was like watching the pinball wizard. Because when we talk about deflection, we can measure deflection. When we talk about port velocities, if we can't measure it, we can model it really, really close. So we have all of these tools today to try to understand what's going on. Ed just saw it. That ability to look inside an engine set Ed apart from his entire generation and probably set the whole performance aftermarket valve train going you know clearly ed winfield was amazing you had people that were doing great camshafts before but really they were just adding some duration to camshafts adding some lift and moving them around ed iskadarian took that science made that into a science and an art form by figuring out what's going inside the engine. Why does the intake need to close later? Why does the exhaust need to open earlier? What is happening under overlap? All of this stuff was really ignored before Ed, at least to what we can see, that Ed set that and made that to go. Um, a lot of people would say, you know, I was brought up under Harvey Crane. I spent my time going down to Daytona Beach, Spruce Creek Drive, going over to Harvey's and learning from Harvey. Harvey Crane was the artist of cam lobes, but he just designed a cam lobe that was the most beautiful camshaft lobe he could for that lift and duration. 
the difference between Harvey, who is as good of a dynamic lobe designer as you could ever imagine, trying to get a lobe that would create, would be stable to a certain RPM at these specs. Ed, in my mind, was even better for our industry because he could figure out what size it needs to be. Together, when Harvey was able to see what Ed had optimized the specs and then design a better lobe, that's how Harvey wound up taking a lot of customers from Ed. But make no doubt about it that Ed had the fundamental understanding. He was probably 30, 40 years ahead of anybody in the field at understanding why do we want to add duration, why do we want to add lift, what are we actually doing in the engine when we change cam specs. And for that reason, first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, Ed Pink. Ed Pink, of course, everybody knows Ed Pink. And uh, I was running the GTP program and had done the, the V8 uh, engine. I had done a magnesium block, aluminum heads, carbon fiber everything. And of course, this is, this is in 19, mid-70s. And uh, the whole engine with the ECU weighed 268 pounds. It was 305 inches. And uh, we were making not quite 600 horsepower with it, which was pretty good. Anyway, we had some issues and I asked Ed, would he take our current engine, look it over, give me some suggestions. Well, that led to Ed taking the program over <laughs> and uh, uh, Ed, just uh, super clever guy. The, the first thing he said, well, why, are, why is the engine together with silicone? And I said, because people aren't using the O-rings that are supposed to go in there. Oh, well, we'll never do that silicone again. And, you know, Ed was so specific about no leaks, easy to take things apart. How do you work on it? An amazing shop, an amazing person, and his record over the years, I don't think there's many people who even come close to Ed in the winds, everything. Anyway, Ed boosted the program with his expertise and a uh, uh, wonderful person to work with. Never raised his voice, never, you know, he just worked and made it happen. And uh, the people in his shop were excellent, which you would expect. Ed demands the best, you know. So uh, I just saw where he put his last engine together, which was pretty cool. And uh, Ed, what a career, what a person, great individual, and uh, can't find a nicer person. Probably one of the coolest things that happened in my career is being able to call one gentleman a dear friend. Ed Pink is that guy. You know, there, Ed Pink was called the old master when I was probably riding on with training wheels. Back in the 70s, you see these advertisements, Ed Pink, the old master. And you see the advertisements with him doing, you know, this plug wire, or you see him in these yellow jackets, and you know, Ed was just the guy back then. But then you go, you meet this guy and you start talking to him, you realize that not only was he the master back then, but Ed Pink has a mind that's just absolutely amazing. When he would get into a project, it didn't matter whether it was for a Porsche, it didn't matter whether it was a land speed, it didn't matter whether it was the FE Fords. He went to work for Toyota, he did all the work on their midget, he went and did the stuff on their drift cars, of course all the work that he did with um, Infinity on the, on the um, IndyCar IRL stuff. Any engine, he could just sit there and look at it and massage it and rub it and he'd always find more power. And I remember like when he was working for TRD, you know, he and I are joking around, we're going to take a sprint car motor and put it into one of these little Toyotas and put this, this driver behind the wheel. 
And it's pretty amazing because we're like, okay, this is a, a 410 World of Outlaw Sprint motor. You know, this guy is going to absolutely lose it. So we start playing with it and everything. We get, you know, no rules, so let's make a longer stroke. Let's get all this stuff. We put this absolute monster of this engine together. And they get out there and they're doing filming on the Canyon Road out in California. And the driver gets out and said, yeah, it's pretty good high. I need some more down low. You know, and so, you know, Ed calls me on my cell phone from the, from, from the event and, you know, and the thing is, instead of just telling him to shut up, Ed was the guy like, okay. And so we went and totally redesigned this valve train system to work with that head, you know, to take this 450 inch sprint car motor and focus the peak torque for the transients down around 3,500, 4,000. And some is still turned 9,000. And I remember working on it. I don't think there was anything like that at the day. And we learned things in that sprint car that we could have, I mean, in the drift car that we could apply for sprint cars because you start thinking about it and go, you know, sprint cars don't have a transmission. They don't have a clutch. They're, you know, if somebody gets on the brakes and then can drag the field down and then shoot off from the online, hey, here's something that, that Ed was playing with with a drift car, which we all made fun of back in the day, and applying the same technology to a sprint car. Um, the midget motors he built probably outran everything, you know, on the track. You look at just the way from the single overhead cam, the camera motors, he was the guy from that. We made special cores for him for that. Um, just anything you could imagine and just total insight. You know, I guess what happened later in the NASCAR days is that to kind of save the engine shops, their intellectual property, what they started to do is make engine builders into specialists. So you had one guy who's like, this guy's a valve train guy. Then you had another guy, he's a top of the piston guy. Then you have another guy, and his top of the piston guy is probably real close with the combustion chamber guy. Then you got another guy that's rings and bottom of the piston. Then you got a rod and crank guy. You've got a cylinder bore guy. You've got everybody who has these different levels of expertise in a certain small window of the engine. You know, what makes Ed Pink and his generation special is that you could ask Ed about any question on an engine and get a great answer. If you want to ask him about rod bolts, he knew about rod bolts. He knew about connecting rods. He knows about counterweights. If you want to talk to him about cylinder bore finish or rings or pins or how the bottom of pins, a piston should be constructed. If you want to talk about, about the valve guides, if you want to talk about valve seats, any part of the engine, you know, and just look at his son and how much success he's had in the carburetors. Ed Pink may be one of the world's best carburetor guys, and he wouldn't even consider that on his resume. You know, when you reach a level where your weaker skills are world class, that's when you get to be called the old master. John was good friends with Mark Heffington at Cam Dynamics. Now, where that started, I don't know. That's I was in the service when all that took place. But John and and Mark were were good friends. So I was. This is before Comp Cams. So we were still involved with Cam Dynamics. And uh, when I got out of the service, I had decided that I wanted a race car. This is. In, in my career, when I still thought I was going to be a racer and I hadn't figured out that race stuff is made to sell and not to use. So I had decided I wanted to be a racer and started racing a little bit and wasn't very good at it. Um, I had a 69 Camaro convertible that raced in Superstock. John had one very similar to it. And he would kick my ass. I mean, just terrible and and we knew each other and were friendly with each other and finally I said I asked him for help and so we 
we started doing a lot of stuff together and uh, he worked on the car part, not so much the engine part, but the car part. And that helped a lot. And then we started working on engine stuff together. Uh, this is when, during the RHS days. And uh, actually completely during the RHS days is, is most of my dealings with him. But um, <laughs> we, we did a lot of crazy things. We'd go to Bowling Green and test and probably make a hundred runs in the car one day at Bowling Green, just testing stuff. Crazy, fanatical, driven tester John was, and uh, he was he was probably the most serious. You know, John had all different kinds of projects he was involved in, from being the fastest Corvette ever to that crazy race they do out in uh, Utah or something where they run fifty miles and I mean, or the drag racing. I mean, whatever he did. He did it at 134%, whatever, he, he did it all the way. And he, uh, I, I was only involved in the drag racing side with him and that about wore me out, I used me up. But uh, we got to know each other really well. There's so many stories to tell about him, but uh, he was just really, really good. And, and I had to race him one time somewhere and and this is where I came home and learned about front shocks and he had never worked on front shocks so much and I would tweak on my front shocks and the lift and the rebound and and uh, I outran him one time and he said you you're cheating you've done something that engine you're cheating and I said no nope hadn't I said it's all in the shocks I don't believe you I said, well, whatever. So I said, here, we'll take these shocks off, put them on your car. And we did, and it picked him up. And so we we had a, that, that whole relationship worked out very well. And uh, he, I, I finally quit the racing and, and he went on and did many other types and we worked together along the way. And I, Billy probably worked with him more on engine stuff as Billy came along and became more and more a part of comp cams, they they got really close. And uh, uh, I saw that develop, and that was comforting to me to watch that develop and carry on beyond me. Uh, and, and I'll say one big difference. John was very analytical about what he did. He studied everything. He wouldn't... Uh, as Bob wouldn't understand timing events of a cam, John understood every event, what it did, why. Now, he didn't really know how to move them around, but he understood what he wanted it to do. And he'd come to us to say, here, this is what I want to do. Now you go do it for me and give it back. So they were very different in those respects, but very similar in the ways that they were just possessed with doing 100% of what they knew how to do. Yeah, as far as I know, he started in drag racing and, and went on from a business standpoint to do his, uh, his street Corvettes and all the other things. And John may have been, maybe next to Carl Wagner, may have been the worst businessman I ever knew because he just could not figure out uh, how to how to keep any money. I mean, he'd either spend it on racing or spend it on women or whatever, but he enjoyed every minute of everything that he did and never worried about money. And after he passed away, his brother came in. His brother was a very successful businessman, and he had the uh, castrol dealership in the southeast United States on the industrial side. Very successful. And uh, he cleaned up the business and got it all straightened out. And he would just shake his head about John and all of his business dealings. But uh, he was really, really good at all the other stuff he did. I'll tell you one little project that we started. 
and it's it's kind of funny how it ended but when in 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 super stock we had to use stock castings for the heads at the time no porting and so we started thinking about acid dipping these heads and neither one of us had ever done any of that so at the time he had a little engine shop in uh, in decatur indiana it was right beside a, a river right behind his shop the bank went down to the river little small river and um, we got a went to the hardware store and got a tub and put acid in it and we put the heads in there and said i don't have any idea how long they need to sit but we'll go down to the pizza hut and have lunch so we went to have lunch and all of a sudden we hear this noise and it's the air raid sirens are going off holy crap you know and we look down the street and there's this big orange plume damn so we hauled ass back and the <laughs> the acid had eaten the brass plug out of the tub and the acid had run down into the river and got onto something else in the river and was creating this massive orange thing so we were real quick before anybody got there had to clean all the mess up and hide it and all of a sudden everybody's coming looking for where this stuff is and we're just saying we don't have any idea what's going on and john was able to do it with a straight face and we said we got it we need to get out of town we got to go so out we went and let that whole thing settle but that ended our uh, or at least ended my development of acid dip cylinder heads but uh it, that was a pretty funny thing that that we did early on and it just shows you got to try crazy things sometimes it turned out people understood not to use brass plugs and they figured out how to acid dip but i never did do it we switched uh, gears at rhs before that you know john was probably one of the nicest people that you'd ever want to meet i mean he wanted to help everybody and he would help everybody he would do anything in the world aside from if you pulled up there a race he wanted to beat you no matter what he wanted to outrun you and um i don't know if it's much of a as much of a story as it is just a statement about him a word about our relationship when he got hurt in california you know he crashed his sub his compact whatever it was i flew out there the next day and he was in a coma he couldn't i mean it was a tragic uh way that all that happened but uh i stayed with him about a week and let his wife cindy go off and get get a breath but um that was a tough loss for me because he was so young and so um uh, energetic and so uh, go do it and, and his smile the smile that john had in every picture you'll ever see of him the smile just melts you even when you'd go to him and say why did you write me that bad check the smile you just say damn i wish i hadn't done that i wish i hadn't brought that up because it melts you you know one of the things that got him a lot of press was um, about 1980 79 80 somewhere in there at the u.s nationals he had a corvette super stock car that was lightning fast and they used to allow a time trial monday morning before the final eliminations and he went up for that time trial and when he was leaving the line the torque of the engine just pulled the side of the block out this is before we had all front mounts and all that it had regular side mounts and just pulled the crack the block pulled that out everybody else would have said you know hell it's four hours before we have to run a not john sitting there thinking and there's a helicopter doing tours around the park and he thought i have a block at the shop that's all ready to go and it's 30 minutes away by helicopter he's thinking and calculating and john was really smart he's a mathematician and uh 
he did the math and he said, I, we might can make this work. So he went and hired the helicopter to fly him to Decatur. They landed, they'd called ahead. The police had the street blocked off. This was, they, they didn't realize we were the ones that created that massive mess, but uh, they had the street blocked off. So he landed the helicopter, went and got the block, put it on there, came back. Well, while he was gone, five or six of us got together and made a plan. On We pulled the engine out, cleaned and laid everything out, got all the tools laid out, where, and everybody knew what they were going to do. He came back with a block. We got it assembled in the car, in the staging lanes, 10 or 15 minutes to spare. All's good. So they call him up there to run. He started it and the carburetor was flooding out. The little piece of silicone where somebody had put a bolt in the line to keep it from leaking, a little piece of silicone came off and got under the needle and seat. So he couldn't make the run, so all that was wasted. But NHRA, contrary to the way they normally do things today, they allowed him, since everybody was following and knew what was going on, they allowed him to clean it out and go make a run, and he was like a full second under the index. It's just. He would have won so easily, but it's just, you know, fate wasn't going to be his friend that day. You know, it just wasn't going to work. So um, I, I fast forward until the day of his funeral. And he had, his shop was in Decatur and next door was a Kmart or Walmart or something. Well, he bought that building. It closed down and he had bought that building and had uh, all around the front of it was like a foyer thing. I don't really know what they intended to do there, but they had laid out all of racing memorabilia all through that. And Jeff Smith was there at the funeral and Jeff and I were an integral part of that engine swap thing. And we're going along looking at this memorabilia and both of us just stopped and locked up in our tracks when we saw the all the pictorial of of all this stuff and i think they even had the piece of the block that pulled out and all this and both of us just cried like babies while we're you know because we love that man and we love this and and what was going on and it was uh that was really something to to see that right there in front of us, it just it just really got to both of us, and as I'm sure it did others, but especially us. John Lingenfelder, we probably have known each other 30-something years, and uh, the one thing about John that was amazing was his smile. He just melted everybody, plus a very, very sharp individual. John was always thinking how to get more power and was always thinking, never, nothing said, oh, I can't do that or that won't work. He tried some crazy stuff, you know, and that's what made John so successful in his business. Where I came along, I was running the Pontiac program and uh, the four-cylinder Pontiac was the first deal for the Fiero and then it went uh, into NASCAR, then it went uh, into road racing, and we went against an IMSA against the 924 Porsche, which had won everything for the last 200 years. <laughs> anyway, and uh, what I couldn't understand was the four cylinder was making more horsepower per cubic inch than what we could get out of a, our V8. We had the NASCAR head head done in the big block, but couldn't come close. And so John, I called John and said, look, we're making over two horsepower per cubic inch. I'd like to see if we could put two four cylinders on a V8. Think you could do that for us? And he goes, well, what do you think for the head gasket? I said, well, you're going to have to fake the head gasket because the water hole, nothing's going to line up. And all we want to do is be able to run it for a short period of time to get some power figures on a V8. They said, sure. So anyway, I sent him some finished heads. And uh, of course, John had to work out how to get the push rods from the V8 up to the cylinder head, which was a 
challenge. But luckily, because he wasn't trying to run water under pressure, you could kind of cheat things around and do it. Anyway, John called me several times and said, I just don't know if I can make this work. This is more difficult than I thought. And I said, well, John, we're not under a time frame here. It doesn't have to be next week. And sure enough, John finally got the thing running, and he could fire it up. We'd have some oil temperature, and then he'd make two poles with it. And of course, at that point, it was pissing water out, and, you know, we'd shut it down. But the point, what we learned was, I couldn't understand. At that time, our NASCAR head was 23 degrees, and the four-cylinder was basically zero degrees perpendicular to the, to the piston. And, of course, we ran a flat-top piston. We never ran a dome. And uh, so, anyway, all of a sudden, John's getting some power numbers that are big. I'm going. I kind of figured out that the cylinder, the, the more you straighten the valves up, the more efficient the cylinder becomes. And uh, that's why we've gone from a 23 to an 18 to a 15 to an 11 degree, and I hear they got some 7 degrees out there. And uh, so anyway, we kind of backed into doing it, but if it weren't for John's perseverance, you know, and his ability, we never would have found out the really reason why. You know, if we want to start talking about John Lingenfelter, he's one of the most interesting people that's ever been in motorsports. John had a passion for life that was really almost unequaled. The broadness of what he was able to do was also something that was just unheard of. You know, there's the the side of drag racing that he really loved, you know, whether it was his green Corvette, whether it was all the comp preliminary racing, pro stock truck, I mean, he did such a great job with that. Then when it came to the Sport Compact, he started taking the Ecotech engines and make those make unreal power. Um, by the end of what they were doing, they actually had bolts going from the pan to the head, sandwiching the engine together to keep from running over the crankshaft. Um, but from my side, John was the guy when I was very young who I would call and ask questions. John was the one who would try anything at the on the dyno. Um, when people started talking about firing order, John called up and he goes, how many firing orders can we do with a V8? And it's like, well, okay, do you want cross plane or you know flat well let's look at cross now and then he ordered one of every cross plane firing order whether it was the center throws this way or that way every firing order you could do and i mean some of the firing orders are bizarre because one of the firing orders will run all the cylinders down one bank and then all the cylinders down the other bank and um, it made for a really odd combination. But, you know, he was doing that before anyone in NASCAR was doing it. This is at the time when people are just playing with four and seven swap. You know, when you have rear, when you have, um, you know, Steve Schmidt, you've got people who are just starting to play with four and seven swap in pro stock. And within a couple of years, he's tried every possible firing order combination. Um, one time, like when John was working with things, he would keep running the lash looser and looser to see if it would work. And, um, you know, one of the times we're sitting there and, you know, I designed something around 30 lash. And, of course, he tries, you know, 35 and then he tries 40 and then he tries 45. And, you know, and it was like a little bit better at 45 so he had to try 50 and then it was worse but you know if you start looking at the velocity was open close the valve it was terrifying me and so when we came back and we started doing tight lash camshafts to try not to have the wheel so far away from the the lifter i remember i remember gordon holloway who's one of his dearest friends so you've got gordon and john and they're they're going billy how much lash do you need to run on this and I was like, well, um, negative 15 thousandths. They're like, well, how in the heck do you run a negative? It wasn't quite that. But how do you run negative 15 thousandths? I said, John, I don't know. But you're going to add 30 to whatever I say. So I figured I'd start at negative 15 and get you a chance to get up to positive 15. Um, 
John had that, that idea. He probably blew up less engines on the track than anybody I knew. He would test everybody else in pro stock if they were going 9,200 on the track, they only dynoed to 8,800. And they're going, okay, this last 400 RPM, I'll just let it kind of lay over. And you know, you'd see people blow up engines on the track all the time. John was like, if I'm gonna run at 9,200 on the track, I'm gonna run at 9,400 on the dyno. Now, just like the firing order side of things, John wasn't trying to build business cases for why you do something. You know, almost everybody that I've ever dealt with deals with like, how do we make money off of this? Or how do we win races off this? What are we trying to accomplish? John wanted to know to know. And whatever it costs to know, however many blown up engines it cost, however many you know, tests it took, he was going to figure out how to make money later to pay for his addiction to finding out. And it was pretty an amazing deal to, to live in an era when you got to call up John on the phone and say, what do you think this will do? Because his mind was always going. He was just always tinkering, always thinking. You know, and the last thing that, you know, for our Engine Builder Hall of Fame, the reason that I, want, that I definitely think John Lingfeld should be a first ballot Hall of Famer is that he could do it in anything. You know, there was a lot of people who could go and be successful in one venue or another. But John could go out there and, you know, the reason we, we he changed the U.S. performance world when he teamed up with Callaway to do that Callaway Corvette. Up until that time, you know, the Porsches, the Lamborghinis, the Ferraris, that was the stuff. And ever since the Ford's one at Le Mans, Americans were kind of like, well, you're a little bit knuckle draggers. So John gets in this thing, starts doing with the turbocharged Corvettes, and all of a sudden they build a Corvette that would absolutely take on the world. And, you know, it made the people at Motor Trend crazy. It made, I'm sure there were people cursing him in Japanese, Italian, and German, you know. But he, he is the reason... Without that power, that car would have never done what it's done. And just to give you an idea of the, the, the confidence, and sometimes it's just overconfidence that John would have, is the idea, you know, they're over there testing this, the Callaway Corvette. And he's like, well, let me in it. I, this guy's lifting going in the corner. This thing's got 10 more miles per hour on it, you know. And you got a professional driver out there. And, he, and John, it wouldn't have mattered if it was Mario Andretti. John would have thought that he could have got behind the wheel and squeezed a little bit more out of it. And so something like that, that, that passion for motorsports, that passion for life, that passion for finding out, that separates John and puts him into what we believe is a first ballot Hall of Famer for the Engine Builder Hall of Fame. The Engine Builder Hall of Fame is born. Amazing, amazing videos. The history, the credit where credit is deserved, and is now, we, you spoke it into existence. Well, this is the best thing we ever did, right? We put that stake in the ground, said we're going to do it, and man, it's been worthwhile. No, it's one of these things that you start going, oh, we're going to do this. But until you start it, and then you go, okay. This, and then there's so many great people. You know, you can't do one of these without ruffling some serious feathers, right? Oh, oh yeah. I'm sure they're in the comments, it's already yeah. blowing up. You can't believe you didn't do this guy or that guy. And we'll have four more tomorrow. Four right. more tomorrow. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah the initial Save class. comments for tomorrow. This will be our, our initial class. We'll be eight personalities, engine builders for the Engine Builder Hall of Fame, but uh, these first four, amazing. Take me behind the scenes to the selection process, because you know that that's always where, the, you know, no one wants to see how the sausage gets made. <laughs> they just want to eat the sausage. We just ate the sausage and it was awesome. Tell me about how the sausage was made. This had to be very challenging and very difficult uh, to make sure that you got it right. Well, yeah. it was an iterative process that really began with defining what the criteria 
is. Right. It can't be a popularity contest. I mean, you know, you can Google search that, right? It had to be what engine builders changed the way we build engines. What engine builders had people that they mentored? Who had the coaching tree? Who had the people who came out? And how did they change our world? Why, why do we do things differently today because of them? Not just they're famous, not just they're great promoting, not just they sold a lot of engines. Yeah, I don't care how many engines you sold. How did you change the way that we that engines are built today? Well, you said it earlier. It's not about how many race wins you had because there's other Hall of Fame for that. Absolutely. Whatever sport you're in, in HRA or NASCAR or whatever, it's about that enduring legacy mm -hmm. that you left an imprint. And you know, the very first video, the very first person, Harry Miller. Yeah. There isn't any of this mm -hmm. without a Harry Miller. A guy that in the infancy of the Indy 500 said, yeah, I, we're going to go do this. We're going to win. No matter what it mm -hmm. takes, we'll figure out a way to win. And, you know, front wheel drive cars. And, I mean, cars that are art. There's mm -hmm. not many race cars in the Smithsonian, but one of Miller's is in the Smithsonian. Right. And not only is the car art, every component of that engine is art. Mm -hmm. You know, that it was making the form right to do what it needed to do. And it was one of the things you'll see on every one that we, we've introduced in this, in this first class is none of them were there because they were out to make money or they were out to do this. They were out to win these races, to, to accomplish this. And they didn't care whether it was easy or hard. They were just going to do it. Right. Whatever it took, let's just do it. Make it happen. Yes. You know, and the thing about Miller that kind of, again, struck me is that it's that legacy effect, too. That it's not just Harry Miller. You had guys like Leo Goosen. You had uh, Ed Winfield. Mm -hmm. uh, the Agajanians were involved. Uh, it, that whole group of people early did. They just kind of propagated and become the, the family tree of the performance racing industry we know now. Right. You don't have... You don't have you don't have Ed Winfield without Harry Miller. You don't have Ed Escudarian without Ed Winfield. Right. So you've, you've got to have him in there. And apparently Ed Pink rode his bike behind uh, yeah. <laughs> Escudarian's shop right. when he was no. a kid. I'm like, right. that's still mind-blowing. They're all hooked up together. They right. really are. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. And we, then, you know, little fun fact. So when you were watching that video with Ed Pink, that 427 camera engine sitting next to him, that was his very last engine that he mm -hmm. ever built yeah and he thought this thing over just a hundred times i mean you know he gets started on it go no i want to do this different i want to do this different and it was it was cool you know get to be behind the scenes and know a little bit about what went on there i mean ed pink is one of my heroes it's like one of these yeah. that ed pink probably could have made our engine builder hall of fame five different times <laughs> right you know for different seasons of his career he's mm -hmm. that amazing of a guy and really his heart and his passion for the industry and the people of it is every bit is his, his skill that he has his hands. And I just hate it that I never got to know John Lingenfelter. The, the, that time I spent with Scooter and yourself and, and John Callies learning about, I, mean, I knew the name. How do you not know the name Lingenfelter? Uh, especially, I mean, Lingenfelter Corvettes. I mean, that recently they did that, what, zero to 150 yeah. back to zero thing. Yeah. And it's like, the Lingenfelter Corvette from 20 years ago was still faster than most of the other cars. Right, and even the, some of the ones he's not known for, he was doing the engines for, and those Corvettes put American motor, American product on the same stage as the best that Porsche, Ferrari, Lamborghini, anybody had to, you know, he's like, bring your best and let's see who's got it. Yeah. And those cars that he, he was involved with, they were at the top. But he had that passion in everything he did and touched so many forms of motorsports. And it's crazy to think that the whole valve angle thing that he was right there, him and Callie's, and yeah. it's like, oh yeah, take this four-cylinder Pontiac head and put it on a V8 and make a run. No, there, there's absolutely nothing that John wouldn't have done. The passion that he had, the inquisitive mind, I mean, like they taught that million dollar smile and just mm -hmm. bring you into it. And it was just like, you would do anything in the world. See all his competitors huddled around his car, putting it together to make a round against them. Right. <laughs> John was somebody who could smile at you and he would make you work your tail off so he could beat you. Yeah. You know? 
But he had that passion. Charisma. Just wanted to go for charisma, it. Charisma, passion, charisma, energy, and uh, contagious. That, yeah. These guys were contagious. Right. Which is why they are Our the inaugural class engine builder hall of fame. Yep. That's why it's there. That's, That's why this is so fun. I can't wait for tomorrow. Four more tomorrow. Oh, better four be more here. tomorrow is going to be fantastic. And then there's going to be next year. Yeah. This is this is just getting started. Yeah, no, a- excellent, excellent work and an honor to uh, to see and be in the field. And, and there should have been a Hall of Fame, and there is a Hall of Fame just like that. Done. Yeah. Made it made it happen. We'll do more tomorrow. But we're going to keep on rolling. Yes. We have got uh, we've got more to come. We're going to do a check-in with Project Pontiac in a few minutes as yeah. well. That is still going on. I've Absolutely. been out there like scouting it yeah but before that we gotta talk a little about balancing with our buddy randy neal what a day what a day what a day but yeah my brain my brain is swollen i've learned so much today they told us don't start cars we are 